This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. They come into the quarter pole, Beholder, and Gary Stevens strikes the front. Gary Stevens hasn't moved on Beholder. Beholder is in front by two. Authenticity, close hatches. Royal Delta's gone, so is Princess and Silmar. An eighth to go, and Beholder is let loose. And Beholder is now clear by four with a sixteenth to go. Beholder putting on a memorable performance under Gary Stevens. Beholder never gave them a chance in the distaff. Wins it easy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Cassano. On this morning's show, plenty of Breeders' Cup news. We will take a look at next Friday's pair of juvenile turf races, and we will welcome in a trio of special guests, two of whom are first-timers to the show. Mr. Phil Sims, who's got uh, Don't Tell Sophia for the distaff, and Mr. Eddie Graham, who's got Hardest Core for the Breeders' Cup turf. And then we'll go to France and welcome in Mr. Freddie Head, who will bring Anadin for the Breeders' Cup Mile. So all of that and much, much more if you stay with us for this, our October 25th edition of the program, which is being sponsored by Parting Glass Racing, Saratoga's original racing partnership. View their new offerings online at partingglassracing.com and by Bloodlines Racing, racing quality runners like Invading Humor and Distorted Beauty. For a look at their newest offering, go to bloodlinesracing.com. Good morning once again on this rather pleasant late October Saturday. Should be around 60 degrees, which isn't too bad. Six and seven days out from the Breeders' Cup, and uh, that's obviously what will be featured in this morning's show. And we begin with plenty of Breeders' Cup news, 201 horses, including 38 from overseas, pre-entered, but there have been several big-name defections, beginning with Beholder, who you saw winning last year's Breeders' Cup distaff in the open. She will miss the race next Friday. Beholder spiked 104-degree fever last Sunday, and her trainer, Dick Mandela, immediately declared her from the distaff. Who will now be favored? Will it be closed hatches or untappable? And Midnight Lucky, who may have been favored in the Philly and Mare Sprint, has been retired. Away from the races since an easy win on May 3rd in the Humana distaff, Bob Baffert didn't care for her workout yesterday morning, and the decision was made to retire her. Midnight Lucky won four of five starts, including a romp in last year's Acorn. And her eminency, an impressive, perfect trip winner of the Surfer Girl Stakes at Santa Anita and Lass, will miss the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf due to colitis and cavorting. The winner of Saratoga's Adirondack, but seventh in the sloppy Frisette, will not run in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. Trainer Karen McLaughlin, not happy with the way she's doing. She'll be freshened up for a three-year-old campaign. And Rajiv Marat, who broke his arm in a spill in the September 27th Jockey Club Gold Cup, will not be back to ride in the Breeders' Cup. His two big mounts, Artemis Agraterra for the Philly and Mare Sprint, and main sequence for the turf will be ridden by Jose Ortiz and John Velasquez, respectively. And Gary Stevens, who just 14 weeks ago underwent total knee replacement surgery, will have a mount in the Breeders' Cup. Stevens will ride the Chad Brown trained Sivolier in Friday's Juvenile Phillies turf. 
That is very good news. That came as a complete surprise to me. Now we have some non-Breeders' Cup news for you. Somali Lemonade, who captured Saratoga's Diana Handicap this past summer, has been retired. Somali Lemonade, who earlier in her career was a confirmed come-from-behind runner, but who showed much, much more early speed later in her career, won six races in about 982,000. And Nelson Bunker Hunt, who parlayed a fortune made in oil and silver into a thoroughbred powerhouse, has died at the age of 88. Hunt, a three-time winner of the Eclipse Award as leading breeder, owned, among others, greats like Dahlia, Exceller, and Youth. All right, next Friday kicks off the Breeders' Cup. The schedule has been finalized, and here is a quick look at the Friday schedule, the four Breeders' Cup races, and the post times, East Coast times, of course, the Juvenile Turf at 525, the Dirt Mile at 605, the Juvenile Phillies Turf at 650, and the Breeders' Cup Distaff at 735. Now, it's impossible without knowing the exact makeup of the field and post positions to give you the selections, who I like on Friday. But I've got a pair of two-year-old grass runners I'm quite interested in for next Friday's Juvenile Turf and Juvenile Phillies Turf. Beginning with the Juvenile Turf, I'm looking at one-time winner, Imperia. Now, we're about to take a look at a piece of each of his two races. Beginning with his debut on Travers Day at Saratoga, he is number three next to last on the hedge in the Darley Colors. Now, no portable rail up, so the fraction should be accurate. The turf was good this day, not firm. After somewhat strange early fractions of 2386, then 4996, that's a 26 second second quarter, set by face the music. Imperia was eased off the hedge to the five or six path on the turn. And even though the winner had something left in the tank, Imperia closed resolutely to just miss with a final two and a half furlongs going in a rapid 2937. Very good over less than firm turf. Imperia, a firster here from Kieran, who's not known to have his babies cranked first time. But here next out in the Pilgrim, Imperia number four, sixth on the hedge, now in the Godolphin blue. Again, no portable rail. Second start, first time Lasix. That's a big plus for Kieran. After an opening half in 48.98 over firm turf, Imperia came off the hedge, but rather than go very wide around the turn, dropped in behind rivals looking for a seam, and when he got it, he really kicked it in to win edging away. The final two and a half furlongs of the Pilgrim run in a very rapid 28.80. Now, considering the fact that Imperia's two races had moderate early paces in both, the anticipated quicker pace in the juvenile turf, I think, should aid him. Now, you may have read David Grenning in Daily Racing Forum reported that Imperia's final workout had to be canceled due to the rainy weather. Well, I texted his trainer, Karen McLaughlin, this morning, asking him about how critical it was that Imperia would miss his final work. Karen texted me back immediately and said, Imperia is doing great. He is a small, light-framed colt who doesn't need the work. He'll fly out tomorrow, and he will gallop into the race. So it does not appear to me that Kieran is concerned in the least with Imperia having to miss his final scheduled work. Now, in next Friday's Juvenile Phillies Turf, I'm looking at Lady Eli from Chad Brown, one of four Phillies he has nominated to the race. Lady Eli debuted on August 25th at Saratoga. She is number nine. She is sixth in the middle of the pack in the red silks. Firm turf, no portable rail. Conservative early pace, opening half in 50.10. Watch the acceleration from Lady Eli. 
Irata Ortiz chose to stay behind the leaders rather than tip wide around the turn. I thought it was a mistake, and it looked like a mistake when he had to await room. And complicated looked to be home free. But Lady Eli, with a tremendous turn of foot late, somehow got up at the wire to win by a nose. Last two and a half furlongs in 29-21. And that's with being stalled in some traffic. Now, her next start came in the Miss Grillo. She is number nine, third on the outside. Ridiculous early pace. Opening half, 51.48, three quarters in 115.86 over firm turf. So you could say this was the perfect trip for Lady Eli. And it was a very good trip. But just watch this acceleration once again. Arad asked Lady Eli for a little in mid-stretch, and boy, does she give it to him. Now, despite asking her for just a brief run, Lady Eli dominates with a final two and a half furlongs in 27.64. Now, I know with the early pace being so slow, they should come home very, very fast. But 27.64 while being asked for run for a very short period of time, I thought was absolutely outstanding. I think, with her style, she can conform to any pace scenario in the juvenile Phillies turf. Both of her races have been visually very impressive. But just like Imperia, she needs to draw well. Now, what is a good draw in these races? Well, it's pretty simple. The closer to the inside, the better. 1, 2, 3 is better than 6, 7, 8. And 6, 7, 8 is a whole lot better than 11, 12, 13. So you want inside draws for both Lady Eli and Imperia. And maybe they'll be good enough to come off the pace and beat the Europeans and the rest of the two-year-olds who will be entered for the juvenile turf and the juvenile Phillies turf. Now... Before we go to the first break, a quick look at Saturday's Breeders' Cup schedule. Here it is. No major surprises. They have changed the times of the juvenile, the turf, the sprint, and the mile just slightly. The classic will go off at 8.35 East Coast time. So there's a quick look at the Saturday Breeders' Cup schedule. And we are up to our first break. When we return, Mr. Phil Sims will join us. As we go to the break, two of last week's guests had two of the first three choices in the Empire Classic. Mike Hushin had the slight favorite in number eight, Sue, while Tom Bush had the third choice in number six, So Lonesome. So we'll take a look at the Empire Classic to the break. Back with Phil Sims right after these messages. And they're off. I love Lulu, so lonesome on the outside. It's Sue. Then comes FNX as they race up the chute. And it's so lonesome with the lead over I love Lulu. Sue's on the extreme outside in third. Sinistra's down at the rail in fourth. Saratoga Snacks in between horses and racing in fifth. Steadying there just a bit was FNX. They've crossed over now to the main track, and it's So Lonesome who sets the pace here and leads by a length over I Love Lulu. Sue and Sinistra right together third and fourth with Saratoga Snacks racing in fifth, and FNX is sixth. Empire Dreams is seventh, a break of almost four. Back to Beauty in the Pulpit, and Awesome Vision is the trailer. So Lonesome in front, little more than a length over I Love Lulu with Sinistra down at the rail and Sue on the outside. The quarter 23 and three, the half mile in 47 seconds as they begin the run into the far turn. Farther back, it's FNX and Saratoga Snacks. Those two are right together. Then another three lengths to Empire Dreams. Followed by Beauty in the Pulpit and Awesome Vision, and they're all chasing So Lonesome, who continues to lead with three furlongs to the finish. So Lonesome, by a length over I Love Lulu. Sue asked for more now on the outside. FNX down at the rail. And then Saratoga Snacks. Beauty in the Pulpit has come on now a bit in between horses. On the extreme outside is Awesome Vision. And then Empire Dreams and Sinistra. Three quarters in one, 11 and one. And it's So Lonesome trying to go wire to wire here. Here. 
there's FNX on the outside to challenge. So lonesome. And FNX, and they're right together with a 16th of the wire. FNX on the outside. So lonesome on the inside. They come down to the wire in the Empire Classic, and FNX wins it. He pulls off the upset. FNX wears down so lonesome. Farther back, Beauty in the Pulpit was third in one minute, 48 and two fifth seconds. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Looking for a racing partnership with proven success? Bloodlines Racing is for you. Using genetic profiling, Bloodlines horses are bred from some of the most successful thoroughbreds in the world. Horses like Distorted Beauty and Invading Humor have won six of their last seven races over the summer and together have delivered to our partners more than $366,000 in earnings. For our latest offerings and opportunities, visit us at bloodlinesracing.com. Bloodlines Racing. Racing quality. Missed one of our TV shows? No worries. Now you can catch all your favorite programs online. Simply log on to CapitalOTV.com and click on the YouTube link at the bottom of the homepage. And look for our new podcast coming soon. CapitalOTV.com. Log on today. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano, and FNX blinkers on for Jimmy Jerkins and Angel Arroyo. Runs down so lonesome by a neck to upset the Empire Classic as the longest shot on the board. Our first guest, well, football fans here in New York might think about the former New York Giants quarterback when his name is mentioned, but our guest is the signal caller for one of the top Phillies and mayors in the land in Don't Tell Sophia. We welcome in live via telephone, Mr. Phil Sims. Phil Marcasano, welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Nice to have you, Phil. As a first-timer to the program, Tell the audience a little bit about yourself, if you would. Okay, well, I'm uh, 53 years old, Kentucky native. I've been in the, pretty much uh, in the horse business all my life. I grew up on a farm in Kentucky, and we had horses, cattle, raised hay, tobacco then. And uh, I've been to training for 30 years now. Just uh, got into it uh, when I was a youngster, and I've Enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. A lot of the horses I I have it, in my stable. I have a stable of thirty five. Probably half are uh, the horses in my barn. I own or own a piece of, which I really enjoy that owning horses. So we just uh, we have a lot of fillies because we we do uh, breed horses here in Kentucky quite a bit. So that's why I may have more fillies than mares than colts. But I just enjoy it. And my son, uh, older son Matthew, he's my main assistant. And he does a really fine job for us. That's wonderful. Now, Phil, in this day and age where you cannot buy a quality set of golf clubs for $1,000, you purchased Don't Tell Sophia for a grand. How in the world did you do that? Well, of course, there was, there was a lot of luck involved in that purchase. Uh, just um, when, I, when I, I buy horses at, at the yearling sales here in Kentucky, I will look at the horse first, and then uh, if I like, if, if what I'm looking for, same physique and, and mentally also, I will then look at the pedigree and see if the pedigree works for me as well. And uh, it, with her, of course, it all did, and I was just very fortunate to get her at that low uh, discount price without <laughs> Phil, take a moment. We're going to have a shot of her on the screen in just a moment. Take a moment to describe Don't Tell Sophia for our audience from a physical standpoint and tell us what she's like mentally. Okay. She, she's a nice, big, strong mare. She's 16'3". Uh, she's a long filly, always had a lot of leg. When she was a yearling, she was kind of big and lank, lanky and kind of clumsy. And I think that's why a lot of people overlooked her probably. She wasn't going to be a two-year-old runner. You can see that. So uh, I was at a farm in Kentucky here. So I was just willing to give her plenty of time. No hurry. And mentally, she's such a sweetheart. And she, now, she's big, big and strong like a colt, but she's really very, very kind. Uh, she shows a lot of confidence in herself. Always has. Nothing bothers her. Nothing faces her. 
she never gets washed out or anything nervous or anything like that. So she just she makes my job much easier. She is four for five this year with her only loss coming earlier uh, this year over a wet track at Oak Lawn here in the Azari. And as we take a look, as we pick it up, she is number four on the far outside. Phil, did she have any excuse this day? She did. About a week going into that, into the Azari Stakes at Oak Lawn Park, she uh, developed what we call a quarter crack, which is in the hoof. It's in the back part of the quarter of the hoof, back toward the heel. And it uh, comes from a coronet band down. It's, and it's, it, it can be painful if you, if you to the touch. And it wasn't bothering her, but it was back far enough where we usually will patch those things. We couldn't put we couldn't put a patch on, it, so we ran her in a bar shoe, and uh, to keep it keep that quarter crack from uh, spreading, getting any wider. And uh, she she ran she ran very well in that race. But I thought maybe she could run just a little bit better. Uh, the bar shoe may have. Uh, May have affected her a little bit. So it's like running with two different shoes on the front, and so uh, after that race, we decided to go ahead and you know, give her some time off. Let that quarter crack grow out, per se, is what you let it do. I grow up, go out the hoof, and uh, that's why she had that uh, extended period of time off. Well, she came back from that extended period of time off with a nice win against the softer in the Locust Grove at Churchill. Then it was on to the Grade One Spinster to face. None other than close hatches again. Um, as we pick it up, going to the far turn, don't tell Sophia, last at the top of the screen. Phil, talk about this grade one victory. Well, she, uh, she, she's, a, she's a big mare, and she doesn't, she doesn't show any early speed. She just takes a while to get, get her going. But once she uh, hits that far turn and then and the race pole to the finish line, she's like a locomotive van. She has her steam going. And she'll just she can uh, mow him down pretty quickly. That point. Joe Rocco Jr. seems to fit her very well. He rides her with confidence. He lets her settle early. Waits to make the run. Talk about that partnership. Yeah, Joe's real good. He I'd say he uh, he lets her do her thing early. He's not doesn't get in a hurry with her because that's what she wants to do. She wants to lag back. And uh, when she gets his race pole, he'll he'll just he'll, he'll pick the bit up in her mouth and smooch to her and say, "Come on, it's now it's time." And and that's the key to her is just having some patience. Don't don't uh, move too soon because he knows he, he does trust her, has a lot of confidence in her. He knows what kind of move she can make, but you've got to make you can't make it too soon. If you do, then uh, she won't have the, the strong finish like she does. Now, Phil, people are going to likely tell you, and maybe they have already or you're going to read or you're going to hear where deep closers cannot win on the dirt at Santa Anita. Do you plan on changing her running style at all in next Friday's distaff? No, we don't. You know, I, I've, I've already been told that, of course, and, and looked for myself. And it is, it is a very much speed bias track. But also in this, this, the distaff, there will be a lot of horses in there and fills in there with a lot of early speed as well. So I'm looking for the fractions, early fractions to be pretty quick. And uh, we're not going to take her out of her game. She has to us to she has to us to do her thing. So uh, she'll just she'll just make her one run and uh, just hope it's uh, hope it's good enough and uh, see how it goes. Phil, how did she come out of the spinster? She's had two works since, including one yesterday. How's she doing? She's doing great. She looks great. She's uh, she's dappled out. Uh, she's, I say she's, she's just, uh, her weight's perfect. Uh, mentally, she's there. She's been, man, this morning, Kentucky, it's a little cool this morning. She's feeling her good. She's bouncing around the barn and just, and that's for her, it's unusual because usually she's just like a, like a big old pony. She, but today, <laughs> this morning, she's pretty animated. So, so that's a good sign. She just, she's, uh, she's, she's, she's just willing to, to, uh, I think wanting to take them on now. So uh, that's what's coming up. And, uh, so we'll see how she goes. When is she going to fly out? And, you know, what, what type of a shipper is she? And would you expect that she'll be able to settle in nicely once she gets to Santa Anita? She flies out, out of Kentucky in tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. And uh, she'll get in, into California around noon tomorrow, the Pacific time. I, I'm not concerned with the shipping because she really, nothing, nothing ever faces her. So I think she'll just like, okay, she'll settle in fine and, 
she'll have uh, some of you know the people around her that uh, with her was here in Kentucky, so she'll know all of us, and uh, she'll say, "Well, where, where are we? What are we doing here now?" <laughs> but she doesn't really. But she does make my job much easier because she she doesn't really care <laughs> about anything. Just like so, she's so laid back. Well, Phil, all congratulations with the tremendous successes uh, with Don't Tell Sophia and all the best next Friday in the Distaff. Be before I let you go, I would ask you to do me one favor, if at all possible. Next, next time you see a future grade one winner and future millionaire come up at auction for a thousand bucks, could you please give me a call? Will do, definitely. You're the first on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Good luck Thank with Don't Tell Sophia. Thank you so much. Phil Sims, ladies and gentlemen, she is going to be fascinating. I know her style does not appear to suit Santa Anita, and maybe it'll turn out that it won't. But she had an excuse in her only loss this year. She faces some real toughies next Friday, but she appears to have a very legitimate chance. And we are up to our next break. When we return, it's off to France, where we'll welcome Mr. Freddie Head. As we go to the break, the E.P. Taylor at Woodbine. The favorite number three, just the judge, using this race as a prep for next Saturday's Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. So pay attention to number three, just the judge, as we take a look at the E.P. Taylor to the break. Back with Freddie Head right after these messages. They're off in the E.P. Taylor Stakes. Angel Terrace Royal Fury shows early speed and quickly from the outside wall of sound. Blasted out of there. And Wall of Sound has taken the lead. Eiffel settles into stride in second position, and Royal Fury is third. Deceptive Vision under a good hold in fourth. Back five lengths off of Wall of Sound. And then we have Angel Terrace at the hedge. Spencer has just the judge. Back behind runners and six lengths off the lead. Then we have Odalise as they run up the back stretch, and Mary Sheik is alongside of Odalise. And Richard King's coat is nursing the speed of Wall of Sound as they run up this Woodbine backstretch. Royal Fury, just a length off, that one in second. And Eiffel is glued to the hedge in third. Deceptive Vision, out of trouble on the outside. Fourth and three lengths off that leader. Making a move now is Mary Sheikah. Mary Sheikah up to the outside of Deceptive Vision. Angel Terrace is at the rail. Then just the judge, seven lengths off the lead now. Odalise trails this field as they chase this front runner, Wall of Sound, into the far turn, 50 and four fifths for the opening half mile. And it's Wall of Sound with four furlongs to go. Deceptive Vision has made a move, comes on second, just a half a length behind Wall of Sound now. Eiffel's to the inside in a third. Then Mary Shika, just the judge, is getting closer in those burgundy silks with less than three eighths to go. And it's Wall of Sound taking them over to the top of the stretch. Deceptive Vision right there in a second position. Mary Sheikah is on the outside. Eiffel is in behind runners. Just the judge looking for a crack or a seam, and they're deep into the stretch. Wall of Sound has put the pressure. Deceptive Vision in the center, and on the outside is Just the Judge. Just the Judge pokes her nose in front. Here comes Odalise. Odalise has come from last. Just the Judge. Odalise on the outside. Those two down to the wire. Just the Judge. Gets the verdict here in the E.P. Taylor Stakes, defeating Odalise and Deceptive Vision with Wall of Sound fourth. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. The big day is here. You've told everybody. You've dressed the part. Your heart is pounding in your chest. Your horse is rolling down the stretch. He's coming. He's closing. He's the winner. You're a winner with Parting Glass Racing. PartingGlassRacing.com. PartingGlassRacing.com. Hey, race fans, head down to the all-new Clubhouse Racebook. 
with live horse racing on more than 250 flat screen TVs, state of the art wagering terminals, and amazing Vegas style atmosphere. The Clubhouse Racebook, 7 Eleven Central Avenue, Albany. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks to Phil Sims once again for having joined us. And just the judge for Charles Hills and Jamie Spencer overcomes an awkward break but gets the job done in winning the E.P. Taylor by a half-length over fellow Euro shipper, Odalise. Our next guest sure knows how to win one-mile turf races, doesn't he? Last Saturday, he won the QE2 at Ascot with Charm Spirit. Next Saturday, he'll go for his sixth win in the Breeders' Cup Mile with Anadin, joining us live via telephone from France. Mr. Freddie Head, Freddie Mark Cassano, welcoming you back to Down the Stretch. Hello, Mark. I'm very happy to be with you. Nice to have you, as always. Freddie, congratulations on the QE2 victory with Charm Spirit. I believe I read where that was the first time in 21 years that a French invader won the QE2. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's, a, it's quite a tough race to win. Uh, this Ascot mile is very tough. And you need a, a fresh horse who likes, likes the soft. So Charm Spirit has done the job well. He's a super horse. Freddie, why was Charm Spirit targeted for the QE2 while Anna Den was pointed to the Breeders' Cup mile? Because I think Charm Spirit is a three-year-old, and uh, I don't like to, to, to go across and have those long journey with a three-year-old. So uh, I, I targeted Anadine because I thought he was more, he was, it was more in his, uh, in his uh, favor to run that race. Well, let's talk Anadine. He is a full brother to the great Goldie Kova. Freddie, tell our audience what is Anadine like and are there any similarities between he and his unbelievable sister. Well, no, they don't look alike. Um, uh, he hasn't got the career that Goldie Covers has had, but uh, he's a very good horse, a tough horse. He came this, this year very well. He was late, a uh, late fall, and um, he was very consistent this year. He's running every Group One in Europe and was always placed. His last run was. Uh, wasn't so good, but he was very unlucky. I think he should have been very close to winning. So uh, the horse, I think, will adapt very well to Santa Anita. And uh, so I expect him to, to do well. Well, we're about to take a look at a piece of the Queen Anne Stakes back in mid-June at Ascot. Anadin, as we pick it up, is fifth in the middle of the screen. First to commit in the run to the line. He's going to finish third in here, beaten by Toronado, who he'll face in the Breeders' Cup mile. What kind of an effort was this, Freddie? It was a very, very good race. And uh, as I said, Ascot is a very stiff mile. And uh, maybe he didn't have the stamina because Anadin is a, he's a real uh, miler, but he doesn't go over a mile. So uh, it, this race was very good. I mean especially running with those, those kind of horses. So um, I think he'll do well in Santa Anita. Freddie, he is winless this year. Is there any concern about that for you? No, not at all, because we've been running in every group one against the best. Uh, we wanted him to show uh, what kind of horse he is. Last year, he, was, he, had, he, had, he wasn't too lucky. He's had a couple of bad luck. And um, this year we wanted to, to make him, uh, to, to let him show how good he is. So um, I think uh, he's, he's done very well. He's done very well. Although he didn't win, uh, he, all his races were very, very good. Freddie, you gave him a break. You gave him a freshening from mid-August to early October. Was that by design? Absolutely, absolutely. That's what I used to do with Goldie Cover and all the horses I brought to the Breeders' Cup. I'd love to run that uh, pre de la Forest at seven furlong at Longshore on Arc Day. It's a very good prep race for, uh, for a race in, uh, in the state. So um, 
That's what I did. The horse is very well. He's very fresh. And uh, I think he'll be, he'll be hard to beat on Saturday. Well, we're about to take a look at a piece of the pre de la Forêt's last start at Longchamp. As we pick it up, he's fourth in the middle of the screen in the white cap for our audience. Freddie, talk about this troubled stretch run. Well, he was behind a horse. He didn't have any room. And uh, when, when he wanted to come on the inside, he, he decided to come on his, on his inside, and the horse just uh, veered a bit and stopped us. So Rigi Pedi had to check and come back on the outside, and he was still finishing at the end. He was picking up, and uh, I, I think with a good run, uh, he would have been very close. His year began, his first race was back on May 1st. And often we hear European trainers lament that, you know, the Breeders' Cup comes at the end of a long, hard year. We have to ship to the United States. That's a difficult thing to do. How fresh would you say Anadin is, you know, at this point in the season? I think he's very well, very well. I was very pleased with the piece of work he has done. And the uh, horse looks well, and um, uh, I think he kept, he has kept his form, and um, I expect him to do very well. I expect him to do very well. Of course, he's a horse who has to, to wait a bit, so uh, the number of runners, we need a bit, a bit of luck, you know, to, to run those races, but uh, with a good run, uh, I think he'll be, he'll take, uh, he'll be hard to beat. Freddie, how do you think, because the Breeders' Cup mile almost always has a fast early pace, how do you think that type of pace scenario is going to suit Anadin? Oh, that will suit him a lot. That's what I want. That's why I aim to, to the Breeders' Cup, because I think that's the kind of races which he would he like, and we haven't got that sort of races in Europe, where you set off quite a slow a slow pace, the first 200 yards, and the faster they go, the better for me. Now, Toronado beat you in the Queen Anne. Tell us, what, what are your feelings about Toronado? He appears to be a very good English miler. Well, of course, on form, it seems very hard to beat him. But uh, we're not at Ascot. Uh, we're in Santa Anita, and my horse, he's very, turns well. He's, um, uh, I think he will, he will like the course. Uh, it's not the straight mile as after. So uh, I think that can make, make the difference. Well, Freddie, as always, we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. And all the best with Anadin next Saturday in the Breeders' Cup Mile. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you, Freddie. Freddie Head, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have done a lot of preliminary work, uh, video work on the Breeders' Cup Mile. It is a brutal race because since Wise Dan went to the sidelines, the race is now going to be guaranteed to have 14 starters. So post position is absolutely critical and the post will be drawn Monday. But this is an unbelievably difficult race, and the Europeans, if they draw well, appear to have, for the first time in a while, a chance in the Breeders' Cup Mile. And who knows the Breeders' Cup Mile better than Freddie Head? All right, we are up to our final break. When we return, Mr. Eddie Graham will join us as we go to this break, the Empire Distaff. Dollar thirty-five to the dollar favorite, number five, Princess Violet from Mike Hushin. So we'll take a look at the Empire just after the break. Back with Eddie Graham right after these messages. And they're off. Story lady away well. Carry me away on the outside, and Penny Mine down at the round. Sunny Desert is up close as they cross over now to the main track. And it's Sunny Desert who will grab the lead from Penny Mine. Carry me away just in behind, racing in third. Then a break of almost three to Princess Violet, who's a fourth in the early going, but six lengths from the front. 
a gap of five. Back to uh, Flip Cup, who's racing in fifth. Story Lady runs in sixth. Unbelievable Dream on the outside in seventh. Lady Grace Note is eighth. And Dreaming of Kara is the trailer in ninth. Penny Mine. Big long shot here, leads by a length and a half over sunny desert and carry me away. Three and a half lengths to a Princess Violet in fourth as they begin the run around the far turn. Now three of them across as Penny Mine drops back at the rail. So it's sunny desert and carry me away and Princess Violet is looming just behind three lengths from the front. A break of six back to storied lady. Dreaming of Kara's on the outside, then Unbelievable Dream, followed by Flip Cup, and farther back is Lady Grace Note. Princess Violet is gaining ground on the front runners now as the field hits the top of the stretch. And here is Princess Violet to take over the lead. Princess Violet did it easily, and she's opened up in the stretch. Princess Violet with a five-length lead. Then it's Carry Me Away, followed by Story Lady. Flip Cup is coming on to take second, but it's Princess Violet and no doubt about this winner. Princess Violet, impressive in the Empire Distaff. Flip Cup second, and Carry Me Away was third. This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. Looking for a racing partnership with proven success? Bloodlines Racing is for you. Using genetic profiling, Bloodlines horses are bred from some of the most successful thoroughbreds in the world. Horses like Distorted Beauty and Invading Humor have won six of their last seven races over the summer and together have delivered to our partners more than $366,000 in earnings. For our latest offerings and opportunities, visit us at bloodlinesracing.com. Bloodlines Racing. Racing quality. The Breeders' Cup World Championships have given us some of horse racing's biggest thrills and biggest payouts, like the $2.7 million pick six payout back in 2003. With a long list of betting options, it's never taken so little to win so much. So don't miss your chance to share in Thoroughbred Racing's richest event, the Breeders' Cup, Friday, October 31st and Saturday, November 1st. Go to CapitalOTBBet.com to wager and win. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Cassano. My thanks to Freddie Head once again for having joined us and Princess Violet. For Mike Hushin and Jose Ortiz dominates the Empire Distaff by five and a half over Flip Cup. Our final guest this morning trains both steeplechasers as well as a pair of flat runners. And one of those flat runners happens to be one of America's best turf horses. He is Hardest Core, who is being pointed to next Saturday's Breeders' Cup turf, and his trainer joining us live via telephone is Mr. Eddie Graham. Eddie, Mark Cassano, welcoming you to Down the Stretch. Oh, thank you for having me, Mark. Eddie, it's very nice to have you. Now, as a first-timer to the program, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. I know you have a steeplechase background. Yes. Um, I have four jumpers um, that race over fences, and then I have two flat horses. Um, pretty much, you know, Rusty that owns part of Hardest Core, I worked for him for a couple of years, and he had mostly steeplechasers. But when I was, was Bruce Miller's assistant for nine years, um, he always had flat horses and jumpers, and sometimes he'd prep his flat horses for over fences before jump race. Um, so I got pretty much, and also my dad was a steeplechase uh, or jockey in the late 50s, early 60s. And um, so I have that kind of background with, you know, all around racing. And as I understand it, you do a lot of training right off your farm in Pennsylvania? Yes, I like that. You know, I have my own program, and, and the reason I have that program is because you know, in Chester County area, I've been around it for 20 years. So all the land I know, and everybody's very nice and lets me um, gallop on the land because I respect it. And um, so I have a certain program for, for the horses. 
Well, that program seems to be working extremely well because when I delved into your statistics for this year, it shows that you are 8 for 13, which is, you know, a reasonably good 62%. That's, yeah. that's awfully good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I know. Some of us get, you know, you just have one of those lucky years, you know. Um, but, I mean, the, I think also the quality of horses I have this year are much better, too. You know, um, I have pretty nice horses, even in the jumping racing and, and the flat horses. Well, we're about to talk about the big horse in your barn in Hardest Core. Now, most folks know, and, and we had Charlie Lepresti on the show a number of times, most folks know about Wise Dan and, and the colic surgery he went through, but very few folks know what happened to Hardest Core. Eddie, he went through a very difficult time. Tell our audience about that. Um, when we got, I, when I went to Keelan to buy him right away, I wanted to make sure we cut him because of his hind end. Um, I thought he would benefit from being cut. Um, we got him home, we castrated him, everything was good. We weren't aware that he had like a hernia problem up there high anyway. Um, so when he was cut, everything looked great and always the next day you ride him or you turn him out. I turned him out. Everything was fine, happy. Went back in the barn. About 15 minutes, I came out. He's uh, laying in, on the ground, neck and colicky. And when I walked over and looked at him, he had all of his intestines out. Oh, my God. Um, so I had to call friends to come over and help me get him into the barn, which was difficult. And then he laid in the barn. We didn't think we were going to get him up. So there was even things that we might have to put him down because, we can't get him up. You know, he's a 17-hand horse. We tried everything, and literally the last minute he pops up, and my friend Emily Taylor, who I rent the farm from, um, she backed the trailer up. I rode in the back of the trailer, and luckily New Bolton's only 10 minutes away, and um, Dr. Southwood was waiting for us, and um, he stopped. He went through the surgery. Like I tell everyone, like the second day, he's banging his feet so I want food. <laughs> and I think he cut like 18 feet. Oh, my Lord. So, Eddie, it doesn't sound as though it took Hardest Core an awfully long time to recover. Um, the one great thing is when he was in stall rest and that, he was always a good patient. You know, he wasn't fucking and playing in his stall and wanting to get out. He was everything we asked him to do. He was class act. I mean, he never... You know, he was a great patient. So that always helps, you know. I mean, at that point, I would guess the furthest thing from your mind is this horse is going to come back and race and race as well as he has. He was yeah, very close to I, death. I, yeah, I, you know, I told the owners that, you know, that I don't know what kind of horse we're going to have after this surgery. I don't know what's going to be left. Um, but... You know, as the, you know, my program, I always jog six week hills. I don't care what the ground is, beautiful ground or not, but I always put a bottom on them. So they jog six weeks, and he was getting stronger and stronger and stronger, doing well um, and happy and enjoying his training. Um, so, you know, I was, after a couple of works, I thought, you know, there was still something there. So, um, Eventually, you know, he's shown what he's made of. That's an amazing story, and he's got to be one tough customer. You uh, found an allowance race at Parks for his 2014 debut, and following right. that easy victory there, you went to Delaware for the mile and a half Cape right. Henlopen Open. As we pick it up for our audience, hardest core number three on the fence. Eddie, talk about this performance, if you would. Um, well, before after Philadelphia Park, he acted like he didn't even run. And um, I never run a horse really back in 15 days, if you watch. If you look at any of my, you know, running a horse back, I always take my time. And But he was kicking the barn down, acting like he wanted to run. I know he would love a mile and a half because he's a big galloping horse. He loves 
you know, the way I train, I train for a mile and a half. Um, and um, he um, came into the race great. And, you know, they went slow fractions in the beginning, and he was right on the, right there close to the lead, just like they did at Philadelphia Park. Um, but even when I talked to Boz after the race, he said um, that he still had another gear that it was very easy for him, even doing the mile and a half. So we were very happy with him. So that's why, you know, we thought this was a perfect prep for to go to Arlington and sing Ledger or the Sword Dancer. It gave me a month and month and a half to, to see where we were. And he was going to the race perfect in the, mile, in the month and a half. So, so we pointed for um, Chicago. You know, Eddie, I know he didn't beat much in there, but when you consider coming off the difficult surgery, coming off having only had one prior start this year, and he had never been a mile and a half before, you had no yeah. concerns about 12 furlongs? Oh, no, because if you look, when he broke his mane, he broke his mane going a mile and a quarter, you know, and he, and he won going a mile and a quarter, I think, allowance race. Um, if you watch his tapes when um, Karen McLaughlin had him, you know, he looked like he'd run all day. I mean, because really, the, I went to buy him if, you know, we were going to run him on the flat in the beginning. If there was nothing left in the gas tank, we were going to run him over fences. So, you know, we bought the horse knowing that we thought he could go the two and a mile, you know. And, and when he trains at home, you can see, you know, he's got that big gallop and he stays. And just like at uh, Delaware Park, I'm not positive, but I think he ran the last half in 47, and that was really without asking. So, Eddie, in watching him on video, now I saw him last year at Saratoga, but I'll be honest, I didn't pay that much attention. But watching his races on video, he appears to me at least to have one of the most massive strides I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and I just think that's a little bit of the program, you know. I mean, you know, a lot of horses, you know, a little bit of that gas tank is their high end, and his high end is, you know, building up those hills. I mean, it's very European training anyway. If you look at the Europeans, the way they dominate distant races. I mean, I would say, you know, old school training European style is kind of similar to my kind of program. Well, following the Cape Henlopen, you mentioned going to Arlington. Now, you were looking at both, originally, the American St. Ledger, as well as the much more difficult Arlington Million. Why did you defi finally decide on the Million? Um, talking to my owners um, and a c couple few other people um, and my wife, we, you know, everybody had this gut feeling. You know, everybody says you always go with your gut, and I know it sounds crazy, but Something always kept telling us to go with our gut for the only two million, and that's the way we did it, you know. And and because all three races were tough. I mean, I mean, Pizza, Pizza Man's a class act horse. Um, he was going into that being ledgers. I think he won like five in a row, six in a row. He likes that distance, you know. There was ten or twelve horses in that race. The ledger, the sword dancer. Those horses were nice. Um, Grand Motions horse. You know, he was a, you know, going to the store dancer, um, and and I always thought Arlington that because the store dancers run on the inner turf, I thought he would like the the bigger galloping course at Arlington. Um, so, at the end of the day, we all had a gut feeling about going to the million, and we did it. We went with our gut. No, the gut turned out to be right because here's yeah. a piece of the million for our audience as we pick it up. Hardest core is number one, fourth on the fence. Eddie, talk about winning one of America's great turf races. Um, it's hard, you know, like people really will never understand how it felt for me. I think pretty much the only people who would understand are the little guys because, you know, a horse like this comes once in a lifetime or maybe never comes. For us guys, you know, we get up, you know, seven days a week, working our butts off, dreaming about having like a horse like Baffert and Fletcher and Mott. You know, they get them in, you know, every month. Um, 
you know, we never really have the opportunity to train a nice horse like this. So for me, it's very humbling and appreciated um, having the opportunity to have a horse like this. Eddie, they're turning for home. He appeared to me to have lost his balance a little bit um, in, in, in the final turn. Is that accurate? No, I think he, he jumped. I think he was going to clip heels and he jumped over. Um, if you look at him, he kind of jumped. Um, and so I think he was trying not to clip heels because they were all quartered right there. Um, so he just kind of leaped. He don't really lose his balance. And in, in Vaz's ride was perfect. I mean, he just so patient. And I knew when I was thinking, oh, I'll be maybe second or third at the 3-8. But when he got him out there in the middle like that and able to get his stride going, I was like, oh, my gosh, he might get there. And <laughs> Vaz gave him a fantastic ride. Well, you ride Ari Luis Vaz, who is not terribly well-known. I imagine your phone has been ringing off the hook with calls from jockey agents of big, bigger name riders, you gonna stick yeah. with Vaz? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the reason my phone doesn't because I've made it clear that it is. I don't care who it is. No one. I'm a. I've been brought up to be loyal, and it wouldn't even be a second thing. Like I mean, Vaz. Pure confidence in Vaz, and Vaz has pure confidence in that horse. I would never in a million years think about making a change. Eddie, and how Boz, did... I'm I sorry. Boz and I, I think Boz and I, are, this year is crazy. I think we're six for six or something like that. Uh, I don't even know. But I know Boz and I have been doing well. Uh, so. that's, that, I'd say that's reasonably good, yes. <laughs> now, yeah. how did he come out of the million? How's he doing? How's he been training? He's doing great. He came out of the million. He shipped back good, and then... You know, I thought, oh, maybe he's a little bit tired. You know, very conscientious. You know, listening to what he's kind of saying to me, and um, you know, eventually I was thinking about going to a race before that. You know, four weeks out, and I was like, you know what? I think the best bet for him is to go in that race fresh and get him happy for a month. I don't have to train him that hard for the one month, and then start getting him going and. Um, I'm glad I made that decision because he's coming right up to this race the way I want him. Well, Eddie, first of all, all congratulations on just a sensational job. I mean, you've got two flat horses. You won the Arlington Million with one of them in your first ever start in a graded stakes race. This is a fabulous story. You have a wonderful racehorse, and we wish you all the best next Saturday in the Breeders' Cup turf. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Eddie Graham, ladies and gentlemen. This has been, and the last chapter has not been written yet, this has been an amazing story. All right, very quickly, before we leave you this morning, let's take a look at the Breeders' Cup schedule. Here's a look at the Friday races, the four Breeders' Cup races. That is, of course, East Coast Times with the Juvenile Turf and the Dirt Mile. And golden sense to me, it, it looks tough in the dirt mile. The juvenile Phillies turf in the distaff. And the two two-year-olds that I'm currently looking at for the juvenile turf and the juvenile Phillies turf are Imperia in the juvenile turf and Lady Eli in the juvenile Phillies turf. They must draw well in the big fields. And then next Saturday, November 1st, First Breeders' Cup race, the Juvenile Phillies at 3.05 will be followed by the Philly and Mare Turf, the Philly and Mare Sprint, which even though it lost Midnight Lucky, that's still a terrific field. The Turf Sprint, the Juvenile, the Turf with Hardest Core, the Sprint, the Mile with Anadin, and at 8.35, the Breeders' Cup Classic. All right, time to thank all the folks who helped Get this week's show on the air here at the Clubhouse Racebook in Albany. Our associate producer, Julie Hoxie and Dan Hayes. Back in the control room in Schenectady, Pat Peretta, as per usual, directing the show, and Dino Contenacci on audio. Thanks to this morning's guests, Eddie Graham and Phil Sims and Freddie Head, and thanks to our sponsors. Parting Glass Racing, Saratoga's original racing partnership, 
For a list of their latest offerings, go online to PartingGlassRacing.com and by Bloodlines Racing, racing quality horses like Full Sisters Invading Humor and Distorted Beauty. And for a look at their latest offering, go to BloodlinesRacing.com. And as always, thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy all the racing action coast to coast here at Capitol. Have a wonderful upcoming week. Have a successful and enjoyable Breeders' Cup Friday. And from all of us here at Down the Stretch, we'll see you next week. Watching OTB TV, a service of Capital Off Track Betting.